Good morning and welcome to the last day of the Orkney International Science Festival 2023. My name is Eric Walker and it's my pleasure to be hosting this John and Anne Cumming Memorial Lecture here in the Phoenix Cinema. I've got a little bit of housekeeping to do for you. Um, there's no fire alarms planned, so if you hear a fire alarm, we will need to evacuate the building using the fire escapes here at the bottom or up at the top. But as I say, just follow us. We'll be out there pretty, pretty quick, so just follow us. Um, if you have a mobile phone, a smartphone, could you just make sure it's set to silent? But don't necessarily switch it off because we have an ingenious way of capturing your questions and comments throughout the talk. If you point your smartphone camera, smartphone camera at the QR code on the left and click on the link that appears, that takes you into the facility that allows you to type in your questions. Equally, if you don't have a smartphone camera that does that, just join onto the picky Wi-Fi. www.slido.com and the code 343 five five four one and that takes you in as well however if you don't like any of that stuff we have the traditional roving mic and you can put your hand up at the end and we'll get the microphone to you to speak and please use the microphone because this is being live streamed so although down here can hear you we need the online audience to be able to hear you as well so before we kick off the event uh, proper the talk proper Howie Firth is going to say a few words. This memorial lecture is dedicated. John and Anne had a, a deep love of Orkney. And in John's case, it went back many generations because the coming family of belonged is the same as the coming in coming and spence the old established orkney family business also in the family is the warren who gave his name to warrenfield originally the cummings go much further back and john was fascinated to trace some of the, the history of the, the family he had a business career which was characterized by ability and also values and standards. And at one stage, he was called in to rescue a fairly large insurance company that hit, had hit a really bad period. And it was really his commitment, his standards, his ability that enabled the company to be turned around and many thousands of jobs to be saved. He in recognition of his services. He earned a certain amount of money. He was awarded certain amounts of money. But rather than spend them on himself, he simply set up a family trust to help in particular education, young, particularly young Orcadians of ability, to give them opportunities that they might not otherwise get. In retirement, he and his wife, Anne, spent a number of years in Orkney. They lived in, in Orkney. And for Anne in particular, who was a very gifted artist, it was a, a special time and an opportunity to paint and for both of them to meet many old friends and make many new ones. So each year we have um, a John and Anne Memorial uh, Lecture on a theme that they particularly liked. What mattered for them was topics that went to the very heart of Orkney, and today's topic surely does that. Back to you, Eric. Thank you, Howie. Right now on to the event, which uh, I thought could be described as an ongoing cereal um, made of oats, oats and bear. Um, I worked in the malting and distilling industry for now on 40 years and uh, cereals were a, a staple in my career. So I'm truly interested in to hear about the, the, a new found importance in relation to our own diet uh, and health. Our speaker today is Professor Karen Scott. Karen is Professor in Gut Microbiology at the University of Aberdeen Rowett Institute. Rowett Institute. 
She leads a research team investigating how gut bacteria interact with the diet and the human host throughout the, throughout the life. So, to tell us a tale of bugs and bear, over to you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. And I'd also like to thank the organizers, particularly Howie, for getting in touch with me and asking me to come and speak here at the Science Festival. I think you're really lucky in Orkney, actually, to have the Science Festival every year because the, va the variety of talks that happen in it are amazing. And I've been privileged to be at quite a few of them this time. And we even got the display of Northern Lights last night as well, just to top up the visit. So that was really great. Anyway, so moving on to my talk, which I really was given this title, Make It With Oats and Try It With Bear, because I've done some work on oats and bear over my career. And I want to try and tie that together with my gut microbiology work that I am doing at the moment as well. But I thought I would just start with a little bit of background where I come from and how I came to be where I am before we go on to introduce the oats, barley, and bear. And I'll focus on a study where we looked at the impact of growing these crops in different environments and what effect that had on their nutritional content. And then move on to talk about why they are important nutritionally, so which health benefits you can get from oats and barley and bear. And then look, s focus on some human studies towards the end where we investigated these health benefits in more detail and then finish up with showing you ways that we can actually all try to add more oats and barley into our daily diets. So a little bit of background. So I'm from Orkney. I may not sound very Arcadian anymore. I had to modify my accent when I went away to university, but um, I was at the Kirkwell Grammar School, now the old Kirkwell Grammar School, I guess. It took a while to find this picture of the old school on the internet. And when I was at school, I, um, when I started in the grammar school, I realized I really liked science. And I was very lucky to have George Blance, who sadly passed away last year, as my chemistry teacher for three years. And he really instilled this love of chemistry. And I knew then that I wanted, whatever I did in the future, chemistry would somehow be part of it. And when I was in sixth year, my sixth year science, sixth year chemistry project, I sort of combined that chemistry into my farming background. Many of you know that my dad, Peter Scott, was the head of Orkney College, and he came up here to teach agriculture. And so for my six-year project, I decided to see whether the effluent that runs off silage when it's in the silage pit actually had any nutritional benefit. And if you could maybe use that to soak something that was less nutritious like straw to make it more nutritious to feed to animals. And of course, this is just a six year chemistry project, didn't really go anywhere. But the main feature of this project was to evaporate silage effluent and investigate what was left behind in the solid material at the bottom of the dish. This didn't come without consequences for the rest of the school. Anybody who knows what silage effluent smells like would realize that that smell went right through the whole school all the time. I don't think I was very popular for choosing this subject. <coughs> but that really brought nutrition into my sort of horizons as well. The other thing that helped me when I was a child was I was given this book for Christmas one year, The Just So Stories by Rudyard Kipling. And in that, that book, Scott, lots of different stories, how the elephant got its trunk, how the tiger got its stripes, etc., etc. And one of the poems in the, the story called about the elephant's child is a poem, and I'll just read out the first few lines of it. So it's, I keep six honest serving men, they taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. I send them over land and sea, I send them east and west. But after they have worked for me, I give them all a rest. And when I was reading this poem, even back then when I was little, I realized that those words are really what drives us all to find out new things. And anybody who's looked after little kids know that you're forever being asked what, why, how, 
by children especially who really want to learn things about the world. And this is really definitely the forefront of scientific research, those questions. So I've structured my talk today around that and you'll hear me mentioning them a lot. So some of the questions to be interested in are what are oats and barley? Why are they important? Is where they're grown important? Who should eat them? When should we eat them? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what are oats and barley? I'm sure that most of this audience know better than me what oats and barley are. But oats and barley are some cereals that we grow and they form a reasonable, they should form a bigger part of our diet than they do. Um, we mainly associate barley with Scotch broth in terms of food and oats with porridge. The main use of barley that's grown is obviously in distilling, as Eric mentioned. So lot, most of barley grown in Scotland goes to, um, well, I'll say that on the next slide, actually. Bare barley is a much poorer relation in terms of how it's grown and how much of it's grown and what it's used for even. Although the variety of products that use bare barley is m on the increase all the time now. And the, re re the, re the new interest in bare has been really driven by Peter Martin at Orkney College, who in 2002 started trying, or my un this is my understanding anyway, started trying to get back to this traditional crop and try and get more people to grow it. And he's been very successful, actually, because if you look at the split in cereal growth in Scotland, these are figures from the Scottish Government from last year's harvest. And you can see that wheat, and barley are by far the biggest proportion of cereals grown in Scotland. Oats is about 5% and bear hardly even makes it onto the pie chart. Um, and if we look at what's happened over the years, the amount of barley grown is fairly static. Wheat's gone up a bit, oats has gone down a bit actually in the last year and bear's gone up massively. So, <coughs> When I was putting this slide together, I thought it was quite interesting that very little of the barley that's grown in Scotland is actually used in food, only 20%. Most of it goes either to malting or for animal feed. If you compare that with wheat, where we use 65% in food, and even oats, more than half of it goes into food. Uh, a lot of the rest of oats is actually used in animal feed as well, and we Scotland exports a lot of oats which is something I also didn't know. Um, I got the figures from bear, of bear barley from John Wishart at Orkney College, and he just updated me yesterday, so these are figures that are hopefully right. Um, but basically, in 2002, we may have got 20 tonnes of bear barley grown a year. Now it's about 240 tonnes, and that's really driven by two key <coughs> avenues that that bear barley goes. Almost a, about 100 tonnes goes down to Brew Flady, where it's used to make their beer whisky. And then Scapa Distilleries also just started making a beer whisky as well. And they take another 100 tonnes of beer bar from Orkney uh, Bursley Heritage Trust. This is only in the last five years. Before that, there was very little beer grown. And what it was, was used for um, mainly in food. Mo all Arcadians have eaten, um, well, I imagine most are all Arcadians have eaten bear bannocks at some point in their lives. And they're really nice, well, I really like them. But that's one of the key places that you would get bear. Um, <coughs> so that's the wee history of cereal growth in Scotland. Interestingly, oats and bear are quite useful crops, particularly for Orkney, because they can grow on more marginal soils. And oats even can improve the quality of soils for the next crop coming along after that. And one interesting fact about bear is that bear contains high levels of folate. This is one of the micronutrients that we actually, as a population, often suffer from deficiencies in. So this is quite a useful thing of bear. So the first part of the talk is going to focus on the nutritional value of these crops. And I got involved in two projects that were investigating the nutritional value of cereals grown in different places. And this was collaborative with various different people, including Peter Martin at Orkney College. And you can see on this map where the sites that the, uh, bear, the barley varieties were grown. 
We've got three sites just on or above the Arctic Circle. We've got one site in Newfoundland and then Shetland, Orkney and um, Dundee. And then the second project was a Scottish government funded project. And here we <coughs> had site compared growth in Orkney, Dundee, just outside Edinburgh and Berwick, and also a site in Wales. So we had quite a range of sites that we were growing these cereals and we wanted to see how the composition of the cereals changed if you grew them in different places. When we think about the nutritional composition of foods, peop everybody, most people are aware of the macronutrient content. So this is what you see on food labels. It's basically the composition in terms of starch, protein, carbohydrates, fiber, and fat. You don't really find out how many micronutrients are present in most foods, but these are really important for us. And Professor Bermano in her talk on Friday, if anybody was at that, she explained the importance of micronutrients to the health of our body and functions in our body very clearly, and I don't work on them, so I'm not going to go into detail on that. But we also need vitamins as well. That's the sort of third nutritional component that we're often interested in. So looking at the macronutrient contents, this is the overall content of these crops. And this was a trial that was done in a field site at Orkney College. This is where they were grown in here. They're not actually grown yet. They've just been planted at this time, this photo was taken. And we compared three different um, varieties of barley and also with beer. And you can see that there is a difference in the amount of starch and protein that these well, five, particularly fiber and starch actually in these varieties. So you, the starch and fiber content of different varieties that are grown in the same place does vary. So what happens if you grow the same variety in different places? Does that have an impact? So here is the same variety grown in the different sites that we had in the NORA study. And again, you can see there's a clear difference. So you look at the starch content. The, the starch content in the Shetland and Orkney growth sites is much lower, and the sugar content is correspondingly higher in the Orkney and Shetland sites. So basically, the starch and sugar content of the same variety that you grow in different places also varies. So where you grow it and the variety you grow matter. And this looks at a bit more at the micronutrient content and again you can see that there's differences between varieties and there's differences between where you grow them. So the overline point is that where you grow and what you grow impacts on the nutritional content of that particular um, oat or barley crop. And generally iron and sodium Sorry, I've added on to this graph the sort of UK average iron and sodium content of the crops. And you can see that some of the um, crops that are grown in the coastal regions tend to be higher in sodium, but they're also higher in iron than the sort of um, basic UK, UK levels. And the micronutrient content varies. And then we, we can do the same for oats. This is some slide of oats. I'm not going to go into this one in too much detail, but it shows basically the same thing, that the type of oats that you grow and where you grow it changes the nutritional profile in terms of the macronutrient and also the micronutrient content. When I was telling my dad about this talk and I said about the sodium content of <coughs> oats and barley that are grown in coastal regions being higher, he was like, oh, that's really bad. You shouldn't say that. I'm like, well, that's, that's the result. We can't change it. But to put it in context, this is the percentage of your daily sodium intake that's in the oats and barley. So it's still way less than 1% of your total daily intake. So it's higher than crops that are not grown near the coast, but it's not high. They're not high sodium foods. They're just, because they're grown near the sea, it's logical that they get a bit of sea spray, they get that salt. So that's why, the, and the soil's got the salt in it, so that's why they're slightly higher in salt. One of the fibres that I'm particularly important, uh, particularly interested in, and I'll speak about this qu quite a lot during this talk, is a very particular fibre called beta-glucan. And this is an important fibre because it's been proven to lower cholesterol levels. So 
So intake of three grams a day of beta-glucan helps to lower blood cholesterol. And of course, that can then help to protect against um, heart disease. So again, if you compare the beta-glucan content of different types of barley and oats grown in different places, you can see that there is a difference. So again, the variety that you grow and where you grow it does have an impact. And what's particularly interesting from this study is that this type of oats, black oats, now these are not really grown widely at all. They've got a very low yield. They've got, they're, they're a bit like bare in fact in a way because they've got very long stems, they're hard to harvest. There's lots of reasons why farmers don't like to grow black oats. But they've got a much higher beta-glucan content than the sort of more widely grown varieties that are easier to harvest. And this is what's happened over the years. As breeding has tried to improve the cereals that are grown for higher, the main focus has been on higher yield and also suitability for malting. And beta-glucan is really bad for malting because it makes the grains all sticky. So they've been deliberately bred out beta-glucan a lot of the varieties of barley that are grown. And <coughs> I'll talk about why that's important in a wee minute. So again, what and where are really important. And that just repeats the same thing again. So the interesting point was that as you went further south growing the oats, you got a slight increase in the beta-glucan content. This was the same variety. And there's lower beta-glucan content in the, very, the varieties that are grown very far north. So how does this compare with our general sort of intake of fibre particularly? So if we look at these graphs, and I, don't, I know this is a bit sciencey and um, not particularly interesting, but I just want you to focus on the two bars at the edges of each of the sets. So we've got white flour and white rice, and they're at the edges. And then in the middle, you've got oats, barley, whole grain wheat, and wild rice. And this looks at the sort of macronutrient and the micronutrient content. And you can see that the oats and barley have got more protein and much more fiber than the white flour and the white rice. If you keep the whole grain flour, you keep a lot of the goodness of the fiber and the protein in the flour. And the same is true for the micronutrients. So the the bars at the edges are smaller than the bars in the middle. So all of the micronutrients are much higher in the more healthy flour, shall we say, rather than the white wheat flour and the white rice. And it's, that's really important because most people, well, I'm speaking, maybe I'm, maybe I'm generalizing too much, but a lot of people like to white bread and white rice and pasta that's made with white wheat flour. So they're not getting as much fiber, and I think probably most people know there's less fiber in them, but you might be less aware that you're also then getting less of these important micronutrients. So we need to really try and increase that in our diet. <coughs> okay, so I think I've answered the question where and what where they're grown is really important and what variety we grow is really important for the micronutrient content. And we need to think about the variety and breeders are trying to breed new varieties that are focused more on nutrition and slightly less on yield. But in order to actually drive this breeding program, we need to prove why they're important. We need to create demand for them. So people need to want to buy these um, types that are, these new varieties that are more nutritious. So we need to educate and create the consumer demand and then the producers will want to do it. So the circle is interlinked and really important. Right, so I'm gonna move on to the second part of my talk, which is really more my area of expertise, I guess, which is why is it important to eat more oats and barley? And I've sort of given you little tasters of why it is already. If we think about our daily food intake plate, this is what we get from the Food Standards Agency, the Eat Well Plate Guide and the Health, and says this is how our daily diet should look. So about a third of our diet should be fruits and vegetables, a third of it should be 
carbohydrate and a small part um, protein, which can come from beans, pulses, fish, eggs, meat, etc. And then you've got a dairy part. And then your oils and spreads and sweet treats and things, probably a tiny part. <coughs> so fibre is a big part of both these, this two-thirds of the pie. And I've been telling you about fibre a lot, and I want to tell you a bit more now. So these are the relative amounts of food that we should all eat. So what is dietary fibre, and why is it important? So dietary fibre can be defined as plant material that resists digestion by human enzymes and is fermented by colonic bacteria. So that's the bacteria that live inside our guts. And I'll explain more about them in a wee minute. It's really important that different types of fibre have different functions. So you might say, OK, I'm going to eat more fibre and you might eat oat cakes all the time. Now, that's going to be good because you're getting more fibre and you're getting all of the little micronutrients that are in oats, but you're still missing out on a lot of other things. So we all know that we need to have a diverse diet, and the more diverse it is in terms of the fibre intake as well, the better. Various different sources of dietary fibre that I mentioned already, but importantly, we can split fibre into soluble and insoluble fibre. And insoluble fibres, like the the sort of tougher um, outer parts of the plants and cereals. So that's the lignin and cellulose part. That's really hard to digest. And we, we definitely can't digest, but very fewer gut bacteria can digest that as well. It's more specialist. Soluble fiber, which is in oats and barley, it is really a nice type of fiber that we need to eat as well. And it's much more accessible for many more of our gut bacteria as well. Um, so oats and barley are important. So importantly from this slide as well is that the recommended intake of fibre, which was 18 grams a day and then was increased to 30 grams a day, partly because they changed the way they measure it. But most people don't even get close to eating 30 grams of fibre a day. Most people eat between 12 and 18 grams a day. And that's from huge surveys of dietary intake across the whole of the UK. So it's really good to raise awareness that we all need to try to increase more our fiber intake and that's because of the health benefits so as well as filling us up so it helps you stop you eating more so it can help against weight gain and also protects against diabetes fiber is known to protect against colon cancer it has general improvement of digestive health and then it's got all those other phytochemicals and minerals that i already mentioned if we look at the specific health claims that are associated with higher dietary fibre intake, you can see here it protects against many different types of disease, quite different diseases. So it's basically a really important part of our diet to keep us healthy. And I'm not going to go into the details, but these are all proven by scientific research that these fibre can do these things. So going back to oats and barley in particular, I haven't mentioned the glycemic index, so this is an important component of oats and barley, so they don't have much sugar in them, so it's a slow release of glucose, and this is really important for people with diabetes, and so that's an additional health benefit of oats and barley. We've got the high fiber, we've got the beta-glucans that I've mentioned quite a few times, so as I said, the beta-glucans can also help you to feel full because of this um, viscous like sticking together property that they have. And they can re reduce blood cholesterol levels. And as I say, eating at least three grams per day of beta-glucan helps to lower serum cholesterol. And you might even have seen this claim on products. Um, if you've ever bought a box of um, Otobix, not Wheatabix, because that's wheat, it's the Otobix that contains the oats, there's this claim on the label of the Otobix. Um, and then the further important part, point about oats is that there's no gluten in oats. So for celiacs, oats are really important, although the caveat is that they have to be guaranteed to be gluten-free because it's even a small contamination. If they're processed in a mill that processes barley as well, that can be enough to contaminate the oats to make them bad for celiacs. 
Okay, so how does eating fibre give us so many health benefits? So I want to go back to the gut microbiota here. This is what I work on and this is why fibre is so important for us. The action of these gut bacteria on the fibre are what gives us many of the benefits of fibre. So what is the gut microbiota? I'm going to use a little schematic that my colleague Alan Walker made because I think it's a really nice way of illustrating to everybody how many and how important our gut microbiota is. So we're all full of important bacteria. This is a microscope slide that shows microbes in a human fecal sample. So how many are there? Well, if we think about the number of people in the UK, it's about 65 million people in the UK. Number of people in the world, about 7 billion, probably a bit more now than it was when this slide was made up. The number of people in one gram of gut contents is 100 billion. And that's how many compared to this. The number of people in Orkney would even be a little spot at the side here. So there's a huge number of bacteria in our gut and they're all important and they all do different things. This one gram is effectively a third of a one pence piece. So that's not all the bacteria in there. We've got 100 trillion in there. This is how much is in this much of a, a poo sample, basically. So we've got a lot more than that. Nobody's got poo that's this big and nice of a baby. Um, <coughs> so what do these bacteria do? Uh, these are just some facts about our gut microbes. So there's more microbial than human cells. They do very important things for our health, which I'm going to tell you about. Importantly, they eat what we eat. So we feed them. So if we have a poor diet for us, that poor diet's what your gut microbes are getting as well. And fiber is really an essential food for them. Everybody in this room has got a very different profile within their guts. So I could look at the microbial profile of each of you. If you gave me a sample on your way out, I could then come back and say who, which sample belonged to which person. It's like a fingerprint. We're all different. So I, junk food doesn't feed our gut bacteria. It feeds us. It provides us with lots of calories. It's all um, absorbed in the stomach, the small intestine. It doesn't reach the large intestine, and that's where most of these gut bacteria live. So the large intestine is the part that's shown in green here. They grow in the fibre, so we need the fibre to get to the large intestine. And then this is an image of bacteria on a fecal fibre. When they grow on the fibre, they ferment it and they produce lots of different compounds, some of which are called short-chain fatty acids. And I don't want you to um, get con overwhelmed by the short-chain fatty acids because I'll, I'll just call them SCFAs. They're just a product of these bacteria. But they're the thing they produce that's really important for our health. So when we eat the dietary fiber, these bacteria ferment it in the gut and it does lots, this has lots of different effects. One of the main first things it does is to lower the pH of the colon and this in itself is really important because this can stop bacteria that make us sick growing. They can't grow at a low pH, whereas the bacteria that normally live there like a low pH. So this lowering of the pH is even in itself really important. They then produce these different short-chain fatty acids, and the different short-chain fatty acids have different benefits to us. So butyrate, it helps protect against colon cancer. Propionate protects against diabetes and heart disease. And acetate circulates around the body and is used to regenerate cells in the extremities of the body. So these are all the important features of them. And basically, they then help to do all these different things within our body. So they help develop the immune system, reduce intestinal inflammation. A new thing that we know now is that they're involved in signaling with the brain. You might think that your gut's got nothing to do with your brain, but I think anybody who's ever got a little bit nervous before they did something knows fine that there's a link between your brain being nervous and the response from your gut. So there's a definite connection between the gut and the brain, and we're learning more about that all the time now. I already mentioned preventing the growth of pathogens, and they also help make us feel fuller after eating, and that's partly due to this gut-brain signaling that goes on. So they're important for many different types of diseases. 
and the specific combinations of gut microbes and the food that we eat, that they then eat, can be either beneficial or detrimental for our health. And I'm going to focus on the beneficial, the fibres that we've already talked about in the oats and the barley. So how do we know about these health benefits? So I'm just going to finish up by talking about four different studies that I've been involved in, either running or collaborated in, that have been run in the Rowa Institute. And they all involve um, getting volunteers to eat either oats or barley. And they mostly involve healthy volunteers. So these three here involved healthy volunteers. The first one I'm going to talk about uh, was some people who had just been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So in the first study, we recruited 20 type 2 diabetes patients. When somebody goes to their doctor and their doctor does the glucose test and says, well, your blood glucose is too high, you're either borderline diabetic or you've got the start of type 2 diabetes. And the first thing that they ask the person to do before they get any medication is they say, I want you to change your diet. So they give them standard dietary advice, which usually involves eating a little bit, increasing their fiber intake, basically. So they get encouraged to eat whole grain breads, increase their in intake of fruit and vegetables. So in this study, they had the standard diabetes diet, and we compared it with an oat diet, where we asked them not to eat any other cereals, just to eat oats. And then we compared, we put them on the standard diabetes diet for eight weeks, and then they would swap onto the oat diet. And for another 10 volunteers, they started on the oat diet, and we then swapped them onto the diabetes diet. And this is quite a standard way of doing a human study. You have two arms of the study, and each individual starts off, you randomize your individuals onto one of the arms, you run them then for however long you're going to do eight weeks in this period, and then you swap them over so that everybody gets both diets. And you compare samples at the beginning of everybody and then at the end of each of the diet points. So in this study, we looked at general um, weight height, weight heights, obviously not weight change, sorry, weight, BMI, et cetera, measurement. We also measured blood samples to get cholesterol, plasma, um, sam plasma glucose, and insulin. And we looked at the microbiota. That was what I was interested in particularly. When we looked at the microbial activity, we could see a little bit of change in the production of these short-chain fatty acids. So we got a small increase in butyrate production, and we got a decrease in lactate. Now, I didn't mention lactate before, but lactate is not one of the beneficial short-chain fatty acids. It's actually quite bad for us because it causes inflammation. So a decrease in lactate is also a good thing. And this happened both on the oat diet, but also on the higher fiber diet when they went on to the general diabetic management diet. And again, in the actual, when we looked at the composition of the gut microbiota, look at different bacterial species that were in there, we found that some of the really important species increased on the oat diet and the general increased fiber diet. And we also got a decrease in other species that might be thought to be detrimental. So it had a good effect on the gut microbiota as well. One of the things that we didn't really expect from this study was that we found that the volunteers that were on the oat diet actually reduced their intake of fruit and vegetables. And you're like, oh, oh how did they do that? And I think what must have happened was that rather than reaching for their apple in the middle of the morning, they maybe reached for a flapjack or something instead. So initially we thought this is, this is a bit worrying, but then the data from both the diets was the same. So it actually shows you that having a portion of oats or whole grain cereal is as good for you potentially as having the fruit and vegetable intake. So since a lot of people struggle to eat the recommended portions of fruit and vegetables every day, then having a bowl of like oats or porridge might actually be a good thing to add to that di dietary advice sort of thing. So we do need to <coughs> validate this a bit more. Um, we found that we didn't have any effect on blood pressure in this one. We did get some cholesterol reduction and we saw the effects on the gut bacteria as I said. 
So the second study, we were looking at um, whole grain foods. This was a much bigger study. We had 220 people, but we didn't do the crossover study. So the power of this study comes from having more people, but because you don't do the crossover, the data is not quite as... Um, it's not quite as useful as th the crossover study, but you have to balance, when you're running these human studies, you balance up the number of volunteers, the length of the study, and the impact it has on the volunteers, how likely they are to stick with you for the time of the study. And because we wanted them all to eat the foods for 12 weeks on this study, if we had a crossover, they'd have been on the study for about 30 weeks or something, because you have to have a washout as well. So we decided to do it this way. So we compared a refined diet with a wheat diet and a wheat and oats diet. And we looked at the blood pressure after six weeks on each diet and 12 weeks. And you can see here that even when the people were on the prescribed diet, the refined diet, there was a slight decrease in blood pressure, but a much bigger decrease on both other diets. So the wheat and the wheat and oats diet had a good impact on reducing blood pressure. And this obviously then has a potential impact on reducing the risk of heart disease. So moving on to the third study, this again went back to oats. So here we were doing an oats study and we had 60 volunteers in this study. And again, this was a crossover study. So we, they were either on the refined cereals diet or they were on the high oat diet and they were on that diet for six weeks and then we swapped them over onto the other diet. And during the study, we again collected blood samples, blood pressure measurements, fecal samples, and we also got them to record their um, food intake. And this was partly to see that they were doing what they were told to do in terms of eating the oats, but also to see if their other food intake changed. We also collected urine samples as well, but I'm not going to speak about them today. So in order to get them to eat the oats, we wanted them to have 100 grams per day of oats. This is this magic number. You need to eat 100 grams of oats to get this three grams of beta-glucan. And I don't know if anybody's ever tried eating a bowl of porridge with 100 grams of oats in it. It's a very big bowl of porridge. So we had to not rely wholly on the meat and porridge. So we developed some recipes that included oats and we also gave them the option to have oat cakes, oat milk. That was quite a good way to increase their oat intake, actually. And then um, various different things. And the recipes I'll go into at the end as well. Um, so what we found in this study, again, we saw this really clear reduction in blood pressure and also in cholesterol. So the increased intake of oats had this beneficial effect on cholesterol and blood pressure. So the final study was one on barley, and this study finished a year and a half ago. So I think everybody will remember what happened in the middle of 2020, which was when this study was in full flow. We had the COVID pandemic, and this really affected the study quite badly. So this study was set up to have 80 volunteers, and we were doing a crossover study, and we'd have eight volunteers in each arm, swap them over, and as I said, that's the most powerful type of study to do. Because of COVID, we had to stop the study early. We couldn't recruit our volunteers. We had to change everything. So we ended up with only 20 volunteers in the study, and that ended up not being enough to find out really good information, which was very sad. Um, anyway, the study was set up. We were collecting blood pressure, blood samples, fecal samples, urine samples again, trying to get as much information from the study as we could. As I said, we designed it as a swap over. So some people started on the whole wheat arm, some people on the barley arm, and swapped them over. And this, re this reminds me about something I forgot to say before. So this fiber, this beta-glucan fiber that helps to lower cholesterol that we find in oats and barley we don't get that fiber in wheat. So wheat doesn't contain that fiber at all. So even a whole wheat arm doesn't have that beta-glucan. It's good for you in terms of fiber, but it doesn't have that soluble beta-glucan fiber in it. The barley that we wanted to use in this study, we wanted to try to reduce the <coughs> amount of barley the people would have to have, but still get that three grams a day of beta-glucan. So to do that, we used a high beta-glucan barley 
that contained more than 5% beta glucan, that meant the people only had to eat 60 grams a day. And this barley was grown at the James Hutton Institute in Dundee, and I got given, I don't know, 100 bags of barley. And I thought, okay, what am I going to do with them? I can't feed them, so they're my volunteers just as they are. So fortunately, when I'd been doing this study with Peter Martin, I had been out to Barney Mill and I'd spoken to the miller, Ali Harkett, and he agreed to mill my barley for me. He put it in between some of his runs of beer through his mill. So this, for people who might not have been at the Barney Mill, some people might not have, it's a mill out in near in Bursey that uh, mills traditionally using a water wheel, you can see here. And this is me up helping Ali to mill the barley. And so we changed our barley into barley groats that we could use for porridge that the people were going to eat in the study and also barley flour that we made into flour tortillas so that the people got to choose if they ate the porridge or the tortillas. So as I said, we didn't have the number of volunteers in this study that we wanted, but we still managed to see a few things. So basically, really, I suppose unsurprisingly, the fibre intake increased on the whole wheat arm and the barley arm of the study. This was a huge increase in fibre intake for the volunteers. But we didn't change the intake of carbohydrate overall or energy or fat or protein, so that was important. We didn't see any effect on blood pressure, which was disappointing, but again, I think this comes down to the number of volunteers. And also, we didn't see a change in cholesterol. When we looked at the gut microbiota, and these are what are called um, principal component plots, and the left-hand side shows the diet. The so these are s microbial samples from each volunteer. So the whole composition of an individual sample is on this graph as a spot. And on the left-hand graph, the spots are coded, color-coded in terms of the diet. So all of the barley spots are dark blue, and all of the wheat spots are sort of this greeny color. And you can see that there's no clustering of the colors. So that meant that none, neither of those diets were driving the composition of the microbiota. But what was driving the composition of the microbiota was who the sample came from. And that's what's shown here. So here you can see that you are getting clustering of colors. And everywhere you've got eight spots of the same color together, that's the eight samples from that same volunteer. So the inter-individual variation in the microbiota is quite high, but there's no effect of the diet on that composition. So, and the, but the but they're very stable. So these samples were collected over 20 weeks. So you can see this volunteer here, the, the fecal sample is not changing much over those 20 weeks. And the same for most of them. So there's this volunteer here is very tight. Some of them are slightly more spread out, but most of them are really tight. So there's very little change in the microbiota over that 20 weeks, which in itself is quite an interesting fact because that's one of the questions that gut microbiologists are always asking, well, how stable is the microbiota? So this wasn't the finding we wanted from the study, but it's still a good finding, really. Um, we did see some changes in some key bacterial species, and I'm still looking into how important this actually happens to be. But both of these bacteria are butyrate-producing bacteria, so potentially this could be quite an important feature of this higher beta-glucan diet. So it's going up on the high fiber diet. So again, it would be what we would expect, that increasing fiber intake generally helps the growth of these particular bacteria that are beneficial for health. So basically, I would say oats and barley are wonderful foods. We should all eat them all the time. Well, not all the time, because you need everything else as well, but we should all eat more of them. They help to decrease blood pressure, decrease cholesterol, reduce the risk of heart disease and many other diseases as well. So they've got multiple benefits and we should all have them, but how do we add them into our diet? How can we make less healthy foods healthier? So as part of the third study I talked about, we actually made a cookbook. So in this cookbook, we took everyday recipes 
and did slight tweaks to the recipes to try to increase the fibre intake and make all of these, um, well, it was done to try and help the volunteers to increase their oat and barley intake, but we've actually end up distributing this book to anybody who wants one because it's very helpful just for general everybody to try to increase their fibre intake in their everyday life. And some of the recipes are savoury recipes. Um, you can think, it's just about thinking outside the box, really. So instead of white rice in your risotto, you can use oats to make your risotto with. You can use barley to make risotto. You can replace rice with barley couscous. Scotch broth, of course, is always going to be there. It's always important. Um, and there's other savoury recipes in the book as well. And, if, and then, of course, you've got the sweet recipes too. So you've got your bare bannocks barley bread, oat cake, barley shortbread, and there is some barley shortbread outside for people to try on their way out. And there are also some recipe cards out there that you can pick up on your way out so you can go home and try out these recipes. And if you want to see all the recipes that are in the book, then I found out the other day that if you just Google the name of the book, which I forget to say, Go With The Grain. So if you just Google Go With The Grain, you actually get into this website. You can see, find the recipe cards yourself in there. So I'll just finish with uh, the who question. So who did the work? So this work has involved lots of people over lots of years. Um, my lab technician, Jenny Martin, who's been with me for a long time and we've done all, all this work together. And then various PhD students. Lindsay Mills was actually up here on Friday Doing, and she was doing the family day on Saturday, in fact. So she was involved in the third study I talked about. And then Peter Martin at um, Orkney College, who was really important for doing the um, micronutrient and the barley growth studies that I talked about at the beginning. And I just thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions now or outside afterwards. Thank you. Thank you for that, Karen. I always feel a little bit guilty when I'm away from home because uh, I don't get my micronutrients properly, but I'll console myself with, uh, I got my cereals basically through drinking Swanee wow. Scapa Special <coughs> in Highland yes. Park and <laughs> Scapa Whiskies. A bit indirectly, though. <laughs> um, if you put your hands up, a roving microphone will come to you and uh, allow you to ask uh, ask Karen a question, but to kick off, I've got some that have come in through Slido, and these are a few comments, but they'll lead to, to a question that's got, uh, oats is a high financial value crop to farmers, but it's a high risk crop if it falls over and lodges, they lose their crop and they get nothing for it. Um, it's also, in addition to the difference in the nutritional values you showed, depending on where you grow them, um, some are less suited to that local environment, you get a way less yield, so there's a whole... Yeah, there. I'm aware it's always a balance with yield and nutritional content and who's going to buy it and all these things. And yeah, it's, it's not an easy answer. It's just something to think about. Yeah. What do you think could be done to promote oats and, well, bare or yeah. high micronutrient containing barley, basically? Well, I guess if, if government come in and like make more help to farmers, if they can, I don't know, subsidies or something might be useful. I guess, yeah, farmers need to make a profit, that's the bottom line, and you can't blame the farmer for that. So I just think that the if government advice and knowledge about why different crops have different nutrition, so I think that, to me, that's the key. If you're, if you're able to know if you're growing the crop that's going to malting or if it's going to go for food, then you can grow the right type of crop. And the breeders are getting on this now I know there's problems with yeah, stem strength and all this and harvesting. Yeah, I, mean, I know it's not an easy answer and I've made it sound a bit too easy probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, you sort of you commented that the you know, beta-glucan content of cereals has dropped mm -hmm. considerably. Is there any one particular in industry that might have had a, an influence on that? Yeah, well, it's so in terms of barley, I'm not less sure about oats, but in terms of barley, it's been driven by the malting industry. So 
high beta glucan content, or my understanding certainly was that high beta glucan content in malting is bad for malting. It affects the way the germination goes and how it all sticks together and it just makes it more difficult. So in some ways that's driven the lower beta glucan varieties to be grown so widely. But now that we might want to move away from so much of it going to malting, and it goes back to your first point, is that it has to be financially viable for the farmer to move from malting to nutrition, but they, wouldn't, they shouldn't grow the same variety that they would have grown for malting if it's going to go into the nutrition diet avenue. So it's the maltsters and the growers and the distillers. Well, you can't blame them either because for a lot of years people will donate barley and scotch broth and there's a limit to the amount of scotch broth folk can eat, so a limit to the amount of barley they would have sold anyway. I'm holding my hands up here. I was chair of the Institute of Brewing Distilling and Barley Committee for years All and right, okay. we did drive <laughs> that down, so I kind of set myself <laughs> up there a bit. Um, you showed some recipes, some ways of cooking things. Uh, are there ways of cooking and preparing foods made from oats and barley that remove or reduce the beneficial micronutrients that you should uh, avoid? So that's a good question. So the, f the honest answer would be is I don't know. I mean, yes, you, you, you do affect vitamins particularly by cooking. I think the micronutrients would be fine. I don't think they would be affected. Um, yeah, I... I I think it would be okay, but we would need, I mean, you, you, the bio, there's this word bioavailability, which is how available all those things are for us to digest. And whilst cooking might affect the content in some way, it might actually make other ones more available. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a sort of balancing act, really. If you think. There's a bit of so cooking and chemistry. In and there, obviously it? you're not going to eat them if they don't taste good. So you have no. to cook them in such a way to make them taste good as well. So. Have we got any questions from the audience? Oh, there we go. It's working. Yeah. Um, is there any recommendation for children as opposed to adults? Because I think your talk is mostly aimed yeah. at adults. Yeah, definitely. That was adult recommended intakes I was talking about. So children are obviously smaller than adults, so they sh shouldn't have such high levels, but proportionally, as part of the diet, it should still be the same. I mean, children do still need fiber as part of the diet. Um, but I'm not aware, and that is something, that is a really important point, actually. There should be different dietary recommendations for children. If there are not, then there should be, and if there are, I'm not aware of them. I need to go and look them up. <laughs> Take one more from the floor if anyone's got one. If not, I've got one to finish with, which is um, how do you enroll as a volunteer on one of your research programs? Yeah, so, it's, so in Aberdeen, we've got a pool of people that um, have been involved in some studies for years, and they, they really like in, enrolling in the studies and doing it. It depends on the study. So some studies you have to live within sort of commuting distance of the research institute because you need to come in, give your samples, get blood pressure taken. Sometimes you need to get blood samples taken every 15 minutes. It depends on the study. Some studies you can do remotely, so, and we're probably moving on to doing that more because there are more different ways of collecting and storing samples now than there were 10 years ago even. So there's more opportunity for remote involvement in studies now than there probably ever was. So they, they just get advertised. Or they're not very good at advertising them, but they do get advertised on sort of local radio and press and stuff. And if, it's, if it was a, if, if your recruitment base could be bigger, then you would advertise it more, more widely. One of my colleagues at the Rowett was doing a study on chocolate one time and there was an article on uh, Radio Scotland on sh saying that she wanted volunteers to eat chocolate and her phone never stopped <laughs> ringing the next day so I think it depends on the study how yeah. popular it is. <laughs> yeah. now, I just I noticed there were people furiously scribbling notes throughout your talk. Um, this has not only been live streamed it's been recorded to YouTube so if you want to look at the slides in detail along with Karen's commentary, just click on the link 
uh, on the on the festival website, and you'll get into this particular talk. So you'll you'll catch everything uh, that way. Um, so I'm just going to do a final bit of housekeeping. Uh, if if you uh, that's YouTube's one of our social media, but we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube channel. We're now on TikTok, and we are also now on LinkedIn. So all these younger people that we've brought in as a festival team, they have <laughs> widened our uh, social media reach, so it's fantastic. Uh, there's an opportunity to sample some uh, oats and beer yeah, food. Yeah, so there's some um, barley shortbread that's been made at the Rowett, and there's also some uh, little oat cakes, I think. And there's the re some of the recipe cards, and they also give you the address for mm. the other cards. And so they're free in the foyer, so you'd have to race each other to get out there. But there's also another opportunity at today's, today's PD Cup lunch. Um, so they're there. There's a f it's an admission at the door. So even if you haven't already booked, just get there in time and uh, enjoy the, the, the foods there as, as, as well. Um, so thank you for that. So anyway, Karen, thank you very much. The support team who, without their work, this, this wouldn't be delivered to uh, either here uh, live or on, online. So thank you very much to them. And of course, to yourselves for making the time to attend. So thank you very, very much. <laughs>